So Enrico asked me to talk about hyperconvergence. And every time I hear anybody talk about hyperconvergence, they say, it's the future. So the title of my session is Hyperconvergence. It's the future. Everybody says so. Um, I am your not so humble speaker. I've spent 30 years in the trenches, um, also writing for trade publications. I currently write at networkcomputing.com. But in my heart of heart, I'm still an engineer and a geek. So I run a test lab, deep storage, where we do things like this. And with Ray Lucchese, I run a podcast called Graybeards on Storage for obvious reasons. And so I'm basically the Radagast, the brown of the storage industry. So the question isn't whether hyperconvergence is the future. The question is, which future are we talking about? Right? The vendors would have you believe that we're talking about the future of the Jetsons. We're going to have flying cars. I'm going to be able to fly to my office, push a button, have the car fold up into my briefcase, and go to work where I push a button four times and then complain that I'm exhausted and Mr. Spacely sends me home. We all know this is not the actual future. We kind of, the future I sold management is this planned city of the future where everything is beautiful and green. I really hope that we're at least talking about the city of the future, but I'm afraid that we're talking about Biff's Casino from Back to the Future 2. And it is entirely possible that we could end up with Judgment Day. So these are all futures. So hyperconvergence is the future. The question is, which one of these futures is it really? So it's kind of de rigueur to say conventional infrastructure is complex. And conventional infrastructure is complex partially because we've been carrying a lot of legacy concepts like fiber channel around with us. And you know, as far as I'm concerned, fiber channel is like smoking. If you haven't started now, there's no good reason to use fiber channel. Um, <laughs> If you are using fiber channel, there are good reasons to continue to use fiber channel. The truth is, if you have a large estate, there are fiber channel management tools that aren't available for IP storage. Um, but I've worked in too many places where we have you know, some IBM blade servers and some extreme switches and a nimble array and some brocade switches and some Dell servers. And we've got 17 management consoles. And then I go to Tech Field Day. And some vendor comes up and says, we have a single pane of glass. And at Tech Field Day, we spell that P-A-I-N, not P-A-N-E, because there has never been a single pane of glass that wasn't incredibly painful. And, but that's really the promise of hyperconvergence, is that we can have storage and compute and networking all managed by a single pane of glass, all using commodity off the shelf hardware and life will be beautiful all the time. Um, of course in that song the next line is and then the nice young men in the clean white coats will come and take me away because this is a dream. It is a very interesting dream and we're starting to see some reality from it. But if we take conventional servers and we take the storage in those conventional servers and through software we create a pool that makes it act like a disk array, that's arguably a very good thing because now I don't have to build a disk array or buy a disk array. The problem is it's very complicated to do this. Right? How, you know, we talked earlier today about how the vast majority of storage is still scale up, not scale out, because distributed systems are hard. And this is a scale out storage infrastructure running as VMs instead of as dedicated hardware. So this is as complicated to build as Isilon was to build because it is Isilon without the hardware. And the concept was really funny when VMware had announced vSAN but wasn't yet shipping it. And every blog post you read said vSAN is going to be the best thing since sliced bread. It's going to be so cheap we'll have 
storage too cheap to meter, and you know, for those of you who aren't like me, Americans, um, power too cheap to meter was the motto of the Atomic Energy Commission. That you know, nuclear power would be so cheap we wouldn't have to have electric meters anymore. And so people were talking about storage would be so cheap we don't have to have meters anymore. But that was kind of assuming that the cost of vSAN would be zero, that vSAN would be a feature of vSphere and would come for free. When you start saying vSAN costs $5,000 for every node that uses the storage, whether, not just the nodes that provide the storage, but also the nodes that consume the storage, the economics become very different. Part of the problem is that I, as you've probably noticed from my heckling earlier, am a steely-eyed storage guy. And that means that I am frigging paranoid because storage guys are paranoid because storage guys know storage screw-ups are persistent. All right? The reason I called Tom naive earlier is I knew the guy who put the wrong version of the software into all of the frame relay switches and took AT&T's frame relay network down. That is a basically as big a network screw up as you can imagine. Four hours later, they restored the old version and everything was working exactly as well as it did before. I also have had clients who had two storage arrays from two different vendors, both of whom bought their disk shelves from Xyrotex. So it was exactly the same disk shelf. But one vendor numbered the drives vertically, one, two, three, four. The other one numbered them horizontally, one, two, three, four. Two o'clock in the morning, disk drive fails. Guy on call at two o'clock in the morning goes into the data center, goes to the one that numbers vertically, thinks it's the one that numbers horizontally, replaces drive seven. And that's now the second failure in the RAID 5 array. And you have to restore from backup. This is not. I, four hours later, everything's back to perfect. This is 16 hours later, I lost nine hours of work. And because there were orders that came in on the website, I don't know what those nine hours of work are to fix it. Like I said, storage guys are paranoid for good reason. So my, you know, the storage guy's standard of resiliency is a dual controller array with RAID 6. You know, that's pretty much where we live today. We don't do RAID 5 anymore because we've made that mistake. Um, and that means that I can afford a controller failure and a drive failure before data exposure, let alone data loss. In a hyperconverged system, most hyperconverged systems default to two way replication. So I can afford a controller loss or a drive loss, but not both before data loss. Any shared nothing scale out cluster is inherently store it media inefficient. In order to be able to afford to have a node fail, you have to at least have enough free space to have that node's data rebuild across all of the other nodes. So you're always buying more media in a hyperconverged system. It is inherent in the architecture. Now, we can ameliorate that by running erasure codes. And here you can see that for various levels of erasure coding, we can get much higher efficiency than the 33% we get with three-way replication. But erasure coding has its own drawbacks. Erasure coding works really well on large chunks of data, not so well on little tiny chunks of data. So if you're trying to run OLTP-like applications with 4K IOs, on an erasure coded system, you better have a lot of flash cache in the performance tier so that you can aggregate them together into big enough chunks to write out to the erasure coded back end. Right. Hyperconvergence began years before the word was invented by Stevie Chambers with virtual storage appliances. VSAs are just two two node hyperconvergence. And in fact, this is the point where hyperconvergence is the best idea. If you have a remote site that runs 10 or 15 VMs, it'll all run on one host. And I buy two hosts 
and I put a simple VSA like Store Magic or the HP Store Virtual VSA on it. And this is a much better idea because no company has ever made a $15,000 disk array I would own. Every disk array in the $20,000 and down category is crap. And so this is a much better idea than that and much simpler. So you will hear vendors talk about deduplication and hyperconvergence. And I'm a big fan of deduplication. But deduplication, as the guys from Exagrid mentioned earlier today, is compute intensive. And compute cycles on a vSphere host cost three times as much as compute cycles on a bare metal server because you buy a $7,000 server and then you have to put $18,000 of software on it before you support the first VM. You, you got to buy vSphere, you got to buy support for vSphere, you got to license Windows Data Center Edition if you have even one Windows VM. And so that means the compute and more importantly the memory necessary to store the hash table reduces the number of VMs you can run on each host. So at some point, the scale economics become untenable. If you need to have 30 nodes of compute and your software defined storage layer that makes it hyperconverged takes 15% of the available CPU and memory. Now I don't need 30, I need 37 servers. If I instead went to some scale out, because I like scale out, dedicated storage appliance, I wouldn't have to buy 18 times $6,000 what is 18 times 6? Yeah, about 100. Um, 100,000 dollars worth of vSphere licenses for the six nodes that are running dedicated as storage. And that 100,000 dollars goes a pretty good way towards the 300,000 dollars the storage system was going to cost. And I also don't have to pay, using vSAN as my example, 3, 30 times 5 is another $150,000 for vSAN licenses and the SSDs and the disks. As you start moving into scale, spreading the storage layer across your system like the mayonnaise on a sandwich becomes less and less cost effective. Now, there is still the big advantage that all I have to do is order this appliance. There's a time to value advantage. If I say I'm going to buy Nutanix or SimpliVity appliances, I only had to make one decision to decide to buy Nutanix or SimpliVity appliances. They're going to arrive at my data center, they're going to be up and running and running VMs the same day. If I decided to architect something myself, well, my experience is the disk array and the servers are going to show up but the optics for the switch are going to be back ordered four weeks. <laughs> and so I'm going to have half a million dollars worth of kit in my data center I can't use till the $150,000 worth of optics show up. And so the time till I can run the VMs is substantially longer. And frankly, you need somebody like me or Martin or Chris to figure out all those decisions and do the architecture. So, even though the economics don't work out perfectly, I understand why people go down this route. It's not a bad idea, it's just not the best idea. Right, so the next question is, are we buying appliances or are we buying software only? And I, I tend, you know, Chris Miller talked about software-defined storage and software-only storage. I, I tend to call it software-delivered storage. That, you know, if I'm buying software, that's software-delivered storage. If I'm buying like Nutanix or SimpliVity appliances with software pre-installed, that's still software delivered, uh, software defined. Wait, you changed on me. So the advantage of appliances, first of all, is tighter qualification. Uh, I currently am working with Next Gen Storage, which is run by the guys who founded uh, Left Hand. And Left Hand sold that software defined storage product 
every way you can sell a software-defined storage product. They sold it on super microservers. They sold it as software only. They sold it on HP servers. They OEM'd it through HP. Eventually, they, couldn't, they missed a funding round and had to sell the company to HP. But when I talked to those guys, they said that the appliances generated a fifth as many support calls as the software only. That everybody who buys software and tries to integrate it with their own servers made some critical mistake. They, you know, well, that Ethernet card and that SAS controller both try and use the same interrupt on the PCIe bus. You didn't know that. And, you know, it's like these are the things that unless you've built a hundred of them, you don't know. So if your total purchase plan is going to be in the tens or dozens, go this way. The headaches, you'll save money going this way, but you're going to spend time, and time is more valuable than money in most organizations. Um, right? <laughs> On the other hand, like I said, hyperconvergence is really attractive in the two, three, four, six node scale. And so it's a great solution for remote offices and branch offices where if you've got remote office, if you're a big organization, you've got remote offices and branch offices of you know, some with five people and some with 50 people and some with 500 people, you can use the same solution to just different numbers of nodes and not have to optimize three different solutions for three different sizes. But at, I'm running a data center of 100 racks of gear, you're, you have to either decide that you want to outsource the architecture process to the hyperconverged appliance vendor, or you want to optimize the purchase. Right? And this is a decision that comes up very frequently in today's data center. Do I run vSphere or do I run OpenStack? Well, if I run OpenStack, I have to hire four PhDs to set OpenStack up for me. And if, I and if I install vSphere, I'm renting the four PhD, the 50 PhDs that VMware has on staff. So if I have a big enough estate to amortize four, VIP, v, four PhDs over, rolling it myself is smarter. If I don't either have the time or the talent, then I'll go rent that and say, I'm going to call Nutanix or SimpliVity and have a turnkey solution delivered. That, you know, at the small scale, hyperconverge is a great idea. At the large scale, there are a lot of trade-offs involved. Right? Who, the, who are the market leaders? Well, Nutanix and SimpliVity have been, you know, Nutanix has about a nine month head start on SimpliVity. They're both in the shipping three to four years category. Um, both ship their own appliances, which, geez, surprise, surprise, come from some Taiwanese server vendor that I never heard of that starts with an S. Um, and have deals with server vendors because server vendors like Lenovo and Cisco recognize they'll sell more servers if they can sell them as hyper-converged and keep people from buying VNXs. Um, each has their advantages, Nutanix, is probably in terms of overall technology further ahead and they're kind of trying to be IBM much like many other companies have over the decades in that they're trying to provide everything. So they now have the Acropolis hypervisor which is based on KVM and SimpliVity still primarily is about vSphere. Um, SimpliVity on the other hand has some integrated backup functionality that Nutanix is missing. Evo Rail was very, very popular to talk about last year. It has never been, however, popular to buy. <laughs> um, because it's ridiculously expensive. I did a blog post on network computing where I dissected the cost of Evo Rail. And I said, OK, so what happens if I like, go to Dell and I buy four Dell servers? and all the software to make it a hyper-converged system and exactly the same disk drives and exactly the same SSDs, and that was 20% cheaper than an Evo Rail. 
at list price all the way around. Um, so, you know, it's VMware's system. I dislike vSAN because vSAN defaults to two-way mirroring, which I've already told you guys I don't think is resilient enough. And to do three-way mirroring in vSAN, you have to have five nodes because you need two witnesses. And five nodes of two 10-core servers and 256 gig of memory each is a really large remote office. Now, the truth is, if you're talking about remote office, branch office, and you're sending your data back to headquarters regularly, then you might be able to go, well, if I lose two disk drives, I'll lose data and we'll have to restore. But to get to the level of resiliency I think is required for production applications in the data center, vSAN means five nodes. Scale computing and Nimbox are addressing the bottom of the market, which means starting prices in the $30,000 range. Pivot 3 is using erasure coding because they came out of the video surveillance world where there's a lot of large sequential data that that works really well for. Um, and Breakwater, really weird spelling, um, is doing OpenStack as an appliance, which they say you don't need three PhDs for, but I suspect you still need one. Which brings us to the end of my prepared presentation. Thank you very much.